people say to me Oh, you gotta be crazy How can you sing in times like these? Don't you read the news? Don't you know the score? How can you sing when so many others grieve? People say to me, What kind of fool believes that a song will make a difference in the end? By way of a reply, I say a fool who sees a song as a song is somewhere to begin the search for something worth believing in if changes are to come there are things that must be done and a song is somewhere to begin and people say to me oh you gotta be crazy how can you dream in times like these don't you read the news don't you know the score? How can you dream when so many others grieve? People say to me, what kind of fool believes that a dream will make a difference in the end? By way of a reply, I say a fool such as I sees a dream as somewhere to begin a dream is somewhere to begin the search for something worth believing in if changes are to come there are things that must be done and a dream is somewhere to begin and people say to me oh you gotta be crazy how can you love in times like these don't you read the news don't you know the score how can you love when so many others grieve people say to me what kind of fool believes that love will make a difference in the end by way of a reply I say a fool such as I who sees a love as somewhere to begin Love is somewhere to begin The search for something worth believing in If changes are to come There are things that must be done And love is somewhere And a dream is somewhere And a song is somewhere to Welcome, welcome everyone to Clean Up Our Act MN, presented by the Climate Justice Team of First Unitarian Society of Minneapolis. I'm the Reverend Kelly Clement, the Social Justice Minister here, and we are delighted that you're with us today. We have an action-packed 90 minutes, and so we've got lots to do, lots to learn, lots to think about. 
This is the land acknowledgement used by the Minnesota Interfaith Power of Light. I welcome you to either close your eyes or lower your gaze. Take a, take a deep breath in and out. Wherever you may be, let us acknowledge that we are all on indigenous land. Minnesota is located on the traditional and contemporary homelands of the Anishinaabe and Dakota peoples, the original stewards of this territory. We are committed to uplifting the name of these lands and the community members from these nations who reside alongside of us. We acknowledge the trauma that is deeply embedded in the foundation of this country. The land we reside on came under control of the United States through genocide, slavery, and ongoing occupation. We recognize the deep historical, spiritual, and personal trauma that has impacted indigenous communities, communities of color, and immigrant communities. By offering this acknowledgement of trauma, we affirm the right of people to bring their whole selves and stories into this space, and we affirm our intention to promote healing, respect, and love. In the Unitarian Universalist tradition, we begin our time together by lighting a chalice, a sign of our shared commitment to justice and hope. These are the words of Winona LaDuke. Mother Earth needs us to keep our commitment. We will do this in the courts. We will do this on our radio stations. We will commit to our descendants to work hard to protect this land and water for them. Whether you have feet, wings, fins, or roots, we are all in this together. My life is blessed by being in the presence of Catherine Jordan. She is a powerhouse, and I'm delighted to say that she is our moderator and MC for today. Catherine, thank you so much. Thank you, Kelly. It's a pleasure to welcome all of you to our second FUS Earth Day event. We have a full agenda of important bills and action items for you to take. I will introduce our guest speakers and keep us on schedule. I'll be giving a two minute head up, heads up to speakers so they know when their time is up. We will have time for questions and answers at the end of each speaker. If you have a question, we please want you to put it in the chat. That's that little uh, box in the middle of your uh, lower bar. It says chat, just click on there and you can uh, write a message to us and one of our facilitators will uh, ask the question. Uh, we are live captioning this session and it will be recorded. So it's now my great pleasure to in introduce our co-chair for the climate justice team, Amy Dreyer, who will set up our frame. Thanks. Thank you, Catherine. So I'm going to speak about reframing our conversation. So as, as was mentioned, I'm a co-chair of the climate justice team at the First Unitarian Society of Minneapolis. During our event today, we're going to look at a few ways Minnesota can clean up our act. Uh, what do we mean by that? Many things. Uh, we need to clean up the way we understand the problem. We need to clean up the way companies frame the problem. We need to clean up our way of addressing the problem. We need to clean up the systems that are supporting the problem. And it needs to happen now. How many of us have heard of the phrase carbon footprint? I'd like to tell a story. The story of the carbon footprint. Carbon is everywhere. It's one of our planet's basic building blocks. Its compounds are in common minerals, shells, coral coal, petroleum, natural gas, and all plant and animal tissue. It helps keep our planet warm. Without it, the oceans would be frozen solid. But our relationship 
was changing with carbon. And that's where the problems began. At the end of the 19th century, the second industrial revolution was underway. And that's when we first learned of the greenhouse effect and that industrial age coal burning would enhance that natural warming effect. By the mid 1900s, warning flags are waving. Temperatures are proven to have risen over the previous century. We've now had two world wars and people and industry are trying to recover. There's changes to the way we live, the relationship with consumerism shifting from, from one more of need to one based more on want and convenience. In the 1950s and 60s, shopping malls and supermarkets are born and brands and consumption play in the creation of identity and community. Also during this period, we're still noticing changes with the earth. The American Petroleum Institute started investigating air pollution in 1958. A decade and several studies later in 1968, the report concluded that the burning of fossil fuels would bring significant temperature changes by the year 2000, and ultimately serious worldwide environmental changes, including the melting of the Antarctic ice cap and rising seas. 1968. But we're far from the introduction of the carbon footprint. So let's continue. As industry is prone to do, they were aware of the significant impacts and spent decades burying the information to protect company profits. Finally, in the late 70s, the US administration became aware of the alarming fossil fuel situation and set out on a course of legislative action. Those short-lived attempts died as soon as Reagan took office and executed an environmental blitzkrieg. But let's get back to the whole idea of brand and identity. Oil companies were releasing billions of gallons of petroleum and natural gas, which many people then knew would warm up our planet. BP, known at the time as British Petroleum, was having a problem, an image problem. They hired a marketing firm called Ogilvy and Mather, and in 2005, they launched the $100 million Helios campaign, a campaign that research has indicated deflected responsibility for climate change away from the corporation and onto the individual consumer. From this campaign, we get the popularization of the phrase carbon footprint. The companies that were making the problem turned it around on us. As one article put it, it's a well-known fact that the most effective defense in a criminal trial is an alternative suspect. One of the most successful marketing ploys of the 20th century was when BP framed you for climate change. It's always been their problem. But the profits over our lives is too great. And it was always someone else in the future's problem to deal with. Sure, we built a society around the consumption of oils-based materials. But our part of this crisis is a sliver compared to their contribution. To summarize our story, the carbon footprint is propaganda. So do any of our personal actions matter? Yes, absolutely. We need to reduce our dependency on oil, including products like plastic. Our carbon impact in the US is greater than anywhere else. But even if we change our habits and lifestyle to be low or no carbon impact, 53.1% of our personal carbon footprint is burned without our consent through things like infrastructure, uh, bridges, roads, and such. For our own mental health, we need to do something. We have a growing mental health crisis in our country, including eco-anxiety and depression. And action, the feeling of making a difference within what we control, is imperative for our mental well-being. There are plenty of personal actions that can help, especially as more people do them. 
again, reduce our dependence on oil through flying less, driving less, and using less plastic. Eat less meat, reduce food waste, grow your own produce, or buy locally grown food. Find other ways to keep carbon in the ground. Just do more than recycle. As we'll learn today is not enough. The most important personal actions we can do is to support as much as we're willing to give to the change in our systems through legislation and regulation. Keep the climate crisis a current event issue. Don't let it die out. Keep fighting. I have a four-year-old and I need to hope there's a viable future for her. Be aware of current legislation. Vote for politicians who support the legislation we need. Contact your politicians for, uh, to voice your support of uh, climate-friendly legislation or voice your lack of support for climate-unfriendly legislation. And if you're energized, join the marches and protests. Every body counts. We need to clean up Minnesota by supporting legislation that will change how the systems work. We need those systems to include all of us and not marginalize people, as Dr. Sam Grant spoke of earlier today. We need those systems to include us all. And the content in today's event highlights some great opportunities to change the way we, as a community, do business. And so we'll hear about uh, the serious issue of plastic and some current legislation uh, from our other speakers today. Thanks. Thank you, Amy. I appreciate that. It's a great uh, summary of what we're going to do today. Uh, now I'd like to welcome Anita Martinez from the First Unitarian Active Voices Advocacy Group. Anita will give us an update on the plastic crisis and what each of us can do to reduce our use and support legislation. Hi, Anita. Hi, Catherine. Thank you very much. Well, we really need to address the plastic plastics issue. It's growing and growing. Next slide, please. We really do have a big problem. It's time to get going. The entire world has been sending their plastics to one company in China. And recently, this company decided not to uh, process our plastics for recycling anymore. You know, I have to say, when you think about it, everybody's sending barges full of plastics across the seas to China doesn't really sound like a sustainable idea anyways. So what should we do? What is the problem? Please, next slide. We'll watch this trailer, which is from, from part of the uh, film that we'll be screening on Earth Day. We'll have a watch party on Earth Day evening um, with with the story of plastic. So please have a look and I hope it piques your curiosity for the film event on Thursday. Go ahead. We're back with an alarming new report that came out this past week on the state of the world's oceans. 32% of plastic packaging ends up littering the environment. 40% is sitting in a landfill somewhere. 14% is incinerated. 14% is recycled. But only 2% is effectively recycled. Down here from the prison, down here from the mall, down here from the factory farm and the hospital. It's not reasonable at all that we continue to live like this. About 8 million metric tons go into the ocean every year. That's the equivalent of one city garbage truck dumping a load of plastic into the ocean every minute of every day. 
This is the story of plastics. It is fossil fuels finding a new form and finding a new place to flow through the economy. The surge of attention to plastic pollution is pretty striking. I believe we're at a tipping point right now. I've seen more policy change globally in the last eight months than I've seen in 20 years of my career. Because not only are governments getting pissed off, but companies are recognizing they can't get away with it anymore. I don't think they can keep on tricking people forever. Wow, what an amazing trailer. Uh, put the next slide. Yes, thank you. So please join us uh, to learn even more by watch by by joining our watch party about the story of plastic. The film will be screened this Thursday, Earth Day, from six to seven thirty p.m. And there will be Q and A. The password is Earth Day, and you can always find all of our links at mnearthday.com. Next slide. Because this is such a big problem, we have to ask our Congress to help us out and our state legislatures. So we must demand that Congress pass the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, which is House Resolution number 5845. This is the same bill that was introduced last Congress by US Senator um, Mo Udall, and it is now called the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. Next slide, please. Here are listed the goals of this legislation to further regulate. So we need what we need to do is to shift the stewardship of plastics manufacture, reuse, recycling and disposal but disposal to the companies and that way uh, we can have a bigger impact if the entire nation is doing things responsibly so please call or email your congressperson and both of your u.s senators to ask them to please support federal bill 5845 the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. Next slide. And while we're waiting around for Congress, we can do some things for ourselves. Hennepin County is sponsoring a zero waste eco challenge. It begins on May 1st. You can sign up for free. You'll get a staff person will help you assess your household and see what actions you can take as a, as a household to reduce the amount of waste you throw away. Uh, this, this information will be free. Uh, they will do it virtually so there's no home visit involved and um, it's a good way to start taking some action. Next slide, please. Another oppor opportunity we have also free is the Global Plastic Free Eco Challenge. This will be happening in July. And it will it you can sign up for free again at our our source page mnearthday.com. So don't forget to join us uh, for the Earth Day film screening of the story of plastic. That's this Thursday, April 22nd from 6 to 7.30 p.m. And please join us. It'll be an interesting session. Thank you. And thank you, Anita. Thank you for pulling all that together. Uh, I did see a not a question, but a comment on chat um, from 
Marita, who talked about 30% of the uh, plastic waste is coming from industrial um, food systems. So all of this hooks together. You can't separate it out. Great. Um, so now it's my pleasure to introduce my friend and representative Frank Hornstein, who will update us on the Minnesota 100% clean energy campaign and other transportation bills. Uh, Frank, thanks for being a real uh, leader in all this work, and we are so happy to have you with us. Frank, Frank you need to you. unmute. All right, there we go. Sorry about that. Well, thank you, Catherine, um, and thank you to the First Universal Society for putting on this excellent and timely um, a gathering, and um, I just wanted to start by, you know, acknowledging this very, very challenging and difficult historical moment that we're in here in our local community. I mean, I, we have the confluence of both a racial justice crisis and a climate crisis, uh, as well as our ongoing health care crisis. And, you know, in every crisis, there's obviously um, uh, challenges and pain. Uh, but there's also opportunities and opportunities to organize and opportunities to look at the world in new and different ways. And um, again, I, I, the, the timing of this uh, is um, so important. It, it coincides with a critical period uh, in the legislative calendar as well. And uh, just last night at um, nine o'clock last night, in fact, um, we did pass uh, a omnibus transportation bill. It's a comprehensive transportation bill in the Minnesota House of Representatives. And I'm familiar with that bill because I'm the author. I, I chair the transportation committee. And um, the, we did a lot in that bill uh, to address some of the issues that we've already talked about today. Um, and I appreciated very much um, uh, uh, Amy's uh, conversation about reducing carbon footprints and, and how important that is in our personal life, but it's not just our personal life. Uh, in order to really make the changes that we need in society, we absolutely have to be engaged and involved in politics and building this incredible grassroots and diverse climate justice movement that is growing and emerging every year. It was referenced in the um, uh, the, the trailer we saw that people are taking action on plastics and the legislation that you're talking about, that makes a huge difference. So what I'd like to do here, and um, uh, Catherine, I think we just have how many, I want to make sure uh, that we have time for question and answer and, and how yeah, many you, minutes set aside. We've got about uh, 20 minutes, 25 minutes or so, and then we'll have Q&A. Okay, good. Well, I don't want to take the, the entire 20 minutes because I want to hear from you all, but... Um, uh, I do want to just go over, um, as Catherine mentioned, uh, a couple of pieces of legislation, uh, and then we can um, uh, take the Q&A. So on the topic of transportation, uh, let's start there, and then we'll get into the um, clean energy legislation. Um, transportation is now the uh, number one source of greenhouse gas emissions uh, in um, in our, in our country, and uh, particularly in the state of Minnesota, while we have um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions from uh, utility industry, agriculture, uh, buildings, um, manufacturing facilities, uh, we're doing a much better job at reducing uh, climate uh, emissions from those entities uh, than we are on transportation. So transportation is not only the number one source of greenhouse gas emissions, that comes from um, the burning of oil and uh, cars and trucks and, and other, um, uh, you know, buses, diesel. Uh, it is also the, as the, the part of the, the greenhouse gas emissions puzzle, if you will, that we're doing the least amount of work on in terms of getting necessary reductions. So in the legislation that we passed last night, I, I wanted to ask three questions in helping to develop this bill. You know, the first is how can transportation 
uh, help transform our economy, help create jobs, uh, building the infrastructure we need for the future as we move out of this pandemic? How can transportation be a vehicle for racial justice, reconciliation, and healing? Um, how can transportation address our climate crisis? All three of these are interrelated. And so when we address the uh, <clears throat> issue of racial justice and transportation, for example, when the interstate highway system was created in the 1950s by uh, uh, President Eisenhower at the time was initiating that, a, a lot of jobs were created, a lot of uh, communities were connected to one another, uh, but issues of equity and, and land use in the environment were not considered. And so we had the destruction of so many black communities. In our region, uh, most notable was the Rondo neighborhood in St. Paul. And that neighborhood was literally cut in half and bulldozed and many, many businesses and homes were lost and people were displaced. So much wealth and income uh, left that community. One exciting way that we're really looking at racial justice and racial and reconciliation and racial reckoning in our transportation bill is that we are funding uh, an effort called Reconnect Rondo. And what this is, is a land bridge over I-94, over several different blocks uh, that um, will connect the two parts of that community that were literally cut in half. And on, on top of that bridge will be parks and housing and a commercial district and urban gardens. And this to me is an example of um, how we can begin some of that healing process. It is initiated by the community. Uh, it has a well-developed funding plan uh, and um, we provide funding for that initial, initial planning process. It's very inspiring. There's been a number of press uh, reports about uh, this effort and, and the work that's been done in our transportation committee on it. Now, another way that we can promote racial justice and equity in transportation is promoting public transportation. Public transportation connects people to jobs and opportunities and shopping and uh, schools and, and the day-to-day -day activities where people can live their lives. Um, and one of the best strategies for reduce, reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the transportation sector is to promote more public transportation. And so a couple of examples of a, a new and modern and effective way of getting people around by bus is something called bus rapid transit. If some of you are familiar with St. Paul, uh, there's a line called the A-Line, which goes up and down Snelling Avenue over to the 46th Street Hiawatha Station in Minneapolis, and then up to Rose, uh, Rosedale Shopping Center. Uh, this is proven to be an enormously popular uh, way to get around. It's a, a bus that moves along Snelling Avenue at a much faster clip than a regular bus would. The stations are a little further apart, but you get on and off very quickly. It's like a, it's like a train. You pay ahead of time. Uh, the platform is low. You just board the bus and you're off. And we want to build an entire network of these rapid buses throughout the region. Uh, and uh, we did get some funding in the last legislative session for two new arterial bus rapid transit lines, the D line, which connects Brooklyn Center. And we know about the uh, uh, importance of that community now, uh, much more than we did in the past, connects Brooklyn Center with the Mall of America through North Minneapolis along Fremont Avenue and through South Minneapolis along Chicago Avenue. Interestingly, uh, George Floyd Square is a uh, 38th in Chicago is a stop on that new D line that was funded last year. And then we have the B line that goes from uptown Minneapolis all the way to downtown St. Paul along Lake Street and uh, uh, along uh, Marshall. And again, through some of the areas that were hardest hit in uh, the, the civil unrest and the uprising that took place, it is a pathway that uh, took last 
that took place in the, after the murder of George Floyd. This is a pathway to opportunity and justice and reconciliation. So we have the intersection of uh, that set of issues with climate change. And I think it's so important when we look at Reconnect Rondo and bus rapid transit. And then finally, uh, on the transportation question, um, uh, uh, Amy had mentioned the need to reduce the amount of driving, that there are alternatives to, to the automobile. And so for the first time in our legislation, we set a goal to reduce what's called vehicle miles traveled. Now, some people criticize this as taking away people's freedom to drive. It's not that at all. It's not a mandate. It's just simply a goal. And, the, and by setting that goal of reducing our vehicle miles traveled by 20%, we will be reducing the amount of oil consumed by encouraging people to walk, bike, drive, take public transportation, encouraging urban planning where people can work, go to school, recreate and shop closer to home. Uh, it was stated on the House floor yesterday by one of the opponents of this uh, part of the bill who said, quote, environmentalists just don't like oil. That's what this is about. Well, I wouldn't disagree with this. Uh, oil is one of the reasons we have our uh, climate crisis. So we need to look at alternatives. Oil is one of the reasons, as we just found out, why we have a, a plastic industry that is out of control, where we can't manage it. Uh, and it's killing our oceans. And uh, we have microplastics in everybody's body and uh, the plastics that are burned uh, create all kinds of toxic chemicals in our air and on and on and on. So we need to transition from oil. We need to find alternatives to oil. One of the best ways for us to reduce oil consumption is to give people options other than driving. And finally, in our bill, we uh, promote electrification of the transportation system. That is another way to reduce greenhouse gases uh, in the transportation sector. So we provide funding for um, electric vehicle charging stations. And let me transition now to the energy bill, uh, which, uh, so we passed transportation last night at nine o'clock and, um, uh, later this week, we'll have an energy climate and energy bill. And I'm very proud of the fact that the Minnesota House of Representatives has a committee called Climate and Energy Policy and Finance. And so uh, Catherine had mentioned the 100% uh, clean energy bill. And uh, this is landmark legislation, which sets a goal that we will have 100% carbon-free energy by the year 2040. Uh, this would make Minnesota among the leaders in um, making that transition uh, to uh, renewable and clean energy. And so there are a number of different provisions in this bill. I don't want to get into um, you know, all of the details, but I can uh, uh, summarize it uh, as follows. Um, again, this is uh, a legislation that is um, pending in the uh, the Minnesota House of Representatives, uh, and, and we'll get into the politics of this in, in just a minute, um, and, and what you can do uh, to, to promote this. But, um, uh, you know, the, the legislation itself is, um, you know, straightforward. Uh, we, 100% energy is what it says. Um, and, um, uh, it is, uh, it is what's known as a, a carbon, I guess the technical name is the 100% carbon-free electricity standard by 2040, House File 278. Representative Jamie Long from uh, South Minneapolis is the author. So it requires all electric utilities to be 100% carbon-free by 2040, increases the amount of electricity that a utility must either generate or procure through renewable energy sources, XL, Minnesota Power, and Great River Energy, which provide electricity to 80% of Minnesotans, are already on a path uh, to receive uh, carbon-free electricity by 2050. So there is some progress being made, but this just uh, uh, really accelerates it. 
Now, I have an amendment to this bill that, that I added, and, and we'll conclude with this because um, I think this is uh, what I'm about to describe is kind of where um, energy and waste policy, again, those images that were shown of the, those plastic bottles washing up on the shoreline and, 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 and finding their way into the depths of our oceans were so jarring and, and, and so upsetting and disturbing. Uh, and um, so how does this relate to energy? Uh, of course, we, we heard about the way that oil uh, is used to create these plastics, but in their disposal, we also have a huge problem and challenge. And again, Amy talked about composting. <laughs> Here is the amendment that I added to the energy bill. The downtown Minneapolis garbage incinerator uh, is considered, get this if you don't know it, because it's very concerning, under current Minnesota state law, that dirty garbage incinerator downtown is classified as renewable energy. It's classified as renewable energy in the same way that wind and solar are classified as renewable energy. That is legislation that passed uh, over 15 years ago, uh, promoted by the energy industry. I think it's a form of what we call greenwashing because that garbage incinerator produces greenhouse gas emissions, quite a bit of greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, under Representative Long's bill that I just described, incineration will be phased out because it is so dirty. It creates as much greenhouse gas emissions, even more on a per kilowatt hour basis than coal. And we all know how bad coal is. And so in the legislation, we, um, uh, take away that renewable definition for the downtown garbage incinerator, which burns a thousand tons a day of waste. Waste that could be reduced first and foremost, recycled, composted. In Minneapolis, we have a residential food, uh, it's not just food waste, but organics waste, composting pickup, that's 31% of the waste stream. We can compost that, we could do a much better job. Uh, we can reduce our waste, we can recycle, we don't have to burn it, we don't have to landfill it. So uh, I look at the, um, uh, uh, there seems like there's a lot of questions already in the chat. So I will uh, conclude with one story here um, because it's an Earth Day story. And I think it, it speaks to the power of the day and the movement that Earth Day really created and spawned, which is the modern environmental movement. In 1970, I was uh, in sixth grade. I liked already rock and roll music at the time. And there was some great music in the late 60s and early 70s that I enjoyed listening to and still enjoy listening to. So the disc jockey on this rock and roll AM station in Cincinnati said, Earth Day is coming up. It's a day to honor the Earth. And here's some things you can do on Earth Day. Maybe you don't wanna get in a car that day. Carry a sign, pick up litter, whatever it is, just do it. So in my sixth grade mind, I decided to do all three of those things. And I would say that um, the uh, uh, movement that that day was a part of led to the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency. We need a grassroots movement to continue to build on what happened on Earth Day. That's what transforms, that's what changes. That's these important acts in Congress and state legislators were influenced by. So I look forward to our conversation. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, do you want me to just go through some of the questions that are in the uh, chat one by one? Uh, Frank, uh, we've got uh, a system here that's going to help you. I'm going to just uh, encourage people to keep writing their questions in chat. And Delaney is going to help us with the Q&A. 
Yep, so I'll be coaching them to you, uh, Representative Hornstein. First question, can we connect suburb to suburb with BRT and other public transit? Well, that's critically important. Thank you for that question. And the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, one of the um, uh, provisions in the legislation that was um, passed yesterday in the House uh, was an additional half cent sales tax for public transportation. And um, what that will do is provide new funding for um, uh, uh, questions. Um, uh, hold on just one second. Okay, we just had a little noise entering the house here. <laughs> make sure that uh, everyone could hear me. Um, so uh, uh, what this half cent sales tax will do is build out a system of local buses, the rapid buses that I described. There's a 2040, uh, a plan to, for 11 new lines by the um, year 2040 that the Met Council has. We can't wait till 2040 to do this. So I am happy to provide Catherine with this map, which details where these lines will be constructed. And that, but that doesn't include the, the, the need for local bus service, which we'll also have. There is also, there's some suburb to suburb service that already exists, but I will tell you quite frankly, it is inadequate. Uh, successful transit goes from place to place where people can, um, access whatever, wherever they need to go. So the answer is yes, but we need the funding and the political will to do it. Thank you, Rep. Hornstein. Next question. Do you know when the MPCA will adopt federal emission standards so we can have more electric and hybrid cars? Well, there is an important process going on in the MPCA now. Uh, we are trying to adopt um, what uh, the, the standards that we believe the federal government will adopt, but California has already adopted, known as the clean car rule. And so there is a legal process that the MPCA is engaging in now. Public comments were re recently taken and they're um, going to create a set of rules. Rules are similar to laws, but they're not uh, created by the legislature. So it's a rulemaking process, a quasi-legal process that the MPCA is now engaging in. Uh, and, you know, the timeline I think is, I don't know exactly, and I can get back to you on that, but I, I think in a, a year, year and a half, that process will be completed. And we're understanding that under the Biden administration, this, this could become a national, uh, a national process. Uh, Ob the Obama administration had it, the Trump administration got rid of it. Now individual states are trying to adopt it based on that California standard. Uh, there's other ways besides the clean car rulemaking in addition, which I strongly support clean car rulemaking and a number of us legislators weighed in on the, um, on the rule process with the PCA. But um, again, electrification of the infrastructure, extremely important, um, uh, public transportation, and bike walk options, extremely important. And then reducing our vehicle miles traveled and creating land use policies that reduce the need uh, to travel long distances by car, also critically important. All three of those strategies have to be taken together. Thank you. Catherine sent in a hard ball. What is the likelihood that your bills will be passed by the Senate? Okay, I was waiting for that question, so thank you. Um, Unfortunately, um, that is uh, going to be a challenge. Um, you know, elections matter. And um, the uh, uh, issue here is that, um, you know, the, Senate, the House is controlled by Democrats, the Senate by Republicans. And, you know, and I, I look, I'm, I know that it's, sometimes we have to be nonpartisan or bipartisan. I try my best to be bipartisan. So I'm just gonna have to put on my partisan hat here if you excuse me and say, we have a party that doesn't acknowledge that climate change is real and caused by humans. And so it, as long as that 
exist, it's difficult to make progress on these issues. And so um, I want to be realistic and say that it'll be a challenge. But on the other hand, if our political system works um, as it should, compromises are made in order to move ideas forward. So the Senate chair of the Energy Committee is, I, I think, moderate on the political uh, spectrum uh, within the Republican Party. And it's my hope that at least on various energy issues, we can make progress, not necessarily as optimistic on transportation. We will do our best to um, you know, ensure that we can make progress as much as possible. Minnesota is, I think, one of two states that has divided government. That means that either the House or Senate is controlled by one or the other party. So we're going to have to get together. We're going to have to work this out. Uh, the governor is indicated that he would sign the type of transportation bill that I have put forward. And he has indicated he would sign the 100% clean energy bill if it were on his desk. But to be honest, we're going to have challenges with the Senate. If you live in a district that has a, a state senator uh, of either party, um, please contact them about this legislation. Thank you. Next question. Do you have any thoughts on the bill for disposing carpeting? You know, that, that bill is an excellent bill and um, I, it is, uh, I believe in the uh, omnibus environment bill that is um, uh, the author of that bill is Rick Hansen and um, that will be debated late next week. Are, are you hearing any background noise? I'm sorry. We have a little background noise here. Is that, are you hearing that? Just a little, but it's completely okay. tolerable. Yeah, not a problem. Um, okay, we'll, we'll take care of that. I apologize. Um, okay, uh, uh, next question, I'm sorry. We have a question from Carol Hamilton. What about the growing truck transportation of goods? She says that she lives in St. Cloud and one day she counted 400 trucks in half the day on 94. Well, this is a huge issue. Um, there is both a uh, carbon uh, and pollution issue, and there is a um, uh, issue with um, a safety uh, with these larger trucks. And so I can tell you as the chair of the Transportation Committee, we, we're trying to deal with at least some of the, the size of the, the truck vehicles and ensuring that um, they're safer. Uh, we are constantly getting requests for um, variances so that heavier trucks can um, travel our freeways. I, I continually resist that. Freeways and county roads and township roads, by the way. Uh, so we want to control truck weights. Uh, but, you know, there, we, we had what we called electric vehicle day <laughs> in the Transportation Committee and Energy Committee. And I asked the trucking industry to, to come and to say, and, and to show us what type of, um, uh, do you have uh, uh, vehicles? Uh, do you have, are you making progress? Can you electrify the, the truck industry? They declined. They didn't say that they had anything of that nature. So, um, you know, as much as I have some concerns about safety issues around uh, freight rail, uh, you know, the transportation of oil, for example, by freight. Um, I do believe the rail industry does a, a much better job in terms of reducing a carbon impact in terms of transporting freight. But it's a real issue. Um, I-94, you know, if you've traveled I-94, even from Chicago to the Twin Cities, tremendous amount of truck traffic. Um, it's a reality. I think that, you know, trucking is been important, you know, and keeping us alive during this pandemic in terms of our freight supply chain. But we need to make those trucks, make sure that they're safe and that we can reduce their carbon impact. Thank you. Our next question, who defined the garbage incinerator as renewable? Well, the, the garbage incineration industry. Uh, it's the people that uh, build these facilities and unfortunately many counties that own and operate them, such as Hennepin County. They have a strong lobby. Um, I introduced legislation several years ago 
to eliminate this renewable uh, designation from garbage incineration. And, um, you know, it seemed to be a, uh, a major employment uh, opportunity for contract lobbyists. Um, it is a, a powerful coalition of, of industry and some elements of the public sector. Uh, but when I was at Clean Water Action, I, I worked as a, a grassroots organizer for many years in the environmental movement before I was elected. And when I was at Clean Water Action in the 1990s, we defeated a garbage incineration proposal in um, Dakota County. Uh, and I learned firsthand that it's what a group of powerful citizens can do to make change. Because we had a group of a, a small citizens organization defeated the 30th largest company in the world that was proposing to build that incinerator. And every level of government that was bought into this as a uh, waste management strategy. So it's a powerful industry. But again, I'm going to return to that story I talked about movement building on Earth Day. This session in the Minnesota House of Representatives, we, we won <laughs> against. It was the first time we were able to achieve victory in the Minnesota legislature against this powerful industry in many, many years, if ever, um, by phasing out incineration in the 100% renewable, again, by 2040. I wish it could be done sooner, but we have a, a complete phase out of garbage incineration by 2040. And at least in Hennepin County, we are not in this legislation not designating it as renewable, that we're actually, remember there was that uh, uh, the, the, the journalist who just retired and uh, Channel 4 who used to have a um, show, a little air area called Reality Check, a show called Reality Check. We finally have a reality check that um, uh, incineration is not renewable. So that's progress. Now, will that survive the Senate? Hard to tell, but again, we'll get into the what you can do to take action section of the uh, uh, program. I think in a few minutes, and I can I can outline that. But that that's why we have that designation. So it's a great question. I appreciate I appreciated getting that question. Yeah, and our next question kind of fits right in with that uh, from Shannon Dotson. She asks, "What can we, the public, do to encourage the changes you're sharing to happen? Petitions, emails, etc. Can you share links with them?" I very quickly will say on mnearthday.com, if you keep scrolling down, we have a lot of links to um, ways you can make change. But Representative, what are ways we can really help make this happen? Well, thank you for that question too. Um, you know, as someone with a grassroots organizing background, um, I believe in the power of organized people to defeat the power of organized money. And that's what all of these environmental uh, issues are all about. All of these uh, issues where we're going up against a very well-funded fossil fuel industry. We're going up against a very, very, very well-funded waste industry and plastics industry. So, um, you know, they have a lot of resources to, to hire lobbyists to, uh, you know, um, uh, fund campaigns, uh, but we have power too. And we have power in our organizations. Um, and I know that uh, earlier, um, you know, in the, uh, uh, the program, a group called Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light um, was mentioned. And, you know, that's a great organization uh, in terms of, um, you know, getting involved as a faith community. Uh, we have so many excellent groups working on the set of issues I've talked about. Move Minnesota works on uh, sustainable transportation. MN350 works on issues like fighting line three and promoting uh, an agenda that is very, very um, uh, ambitious and bold, uh, organizing at the grassroots level on climate change. You know, Sierra Club does excellent work the Minnesota Environmental Partnership. There's a BIPOC table of organizers uh, you know, in, in Minneapolis that's doing great work. Uh, a, a group in the Latinx community called Copal is um, working a lot on environmental justice. Uh, we have legislation, I should have mentioned this, Catherine. Um, there's legislation that uh, talks about 
exam for requiring the pollution control agency to talk about to address cumulative impacts of different you know pollutants on BIPOC communities, on frontline environmental justice communities. Again, that intersection of racial justice and environmental justice. So many of our issues. Again, inspiring what you do. Uh, I, I don't go to too, uh, enough meetings or too many meetings where people read that land acknowledgement at the beginning, where we acknowledge indigenous genocide. We acknowledge uh, the impact of colonialism uh, uh, on the land and on the people. And so um, I think we're in Minnesota, I have not seen until recently this level of engagement on environmental justice issues. So there's many, at, uh, the bottom line is join an organization, be part of an organization. Uh, organizations work together. They can tell you when and where to write letters to. Uh, showing up at a, a rally, um, you know, when, when we are able to be together at the Capitol showing up there, but there's ways to virtually show up at the Capitol or at the county board meetings and things of that nature uh, until we are able to be together uh, after the pandemic when it's safe to do so. So join an organization. The ones I mentioned are just a few of them, uh, but I think that that would be my uh, advice to you. Frank, I think we have uh, time for one more question. I'm going to just say Ruth Agar, who's our, our incredible uh, senior member. She's kind of the queen of, uh, of our congregation. And uh, she writes she, me very often, by the way. <laughs> she does? You should write letters. You should be like Ruth and write letters and, 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 and be like Ruth and make them handwritten letters. They're even more effective that way. All right, Ruth, good work. Well, she asked where or will there be provisions in legislation for elderly, disabled, uh, example for Metro Mobility funding? I am so glad, Ruth, that you asked that question because um, Metro Mobility is a mandated federal program. It is sorely underfunded. Uh, it helps people with disabilities and it helps senior citizens. And it is often the only way for uh, people to get around. And so uh, we, in our bill yesterday, we um, added an amendment that would make Metro Mobility part of the state budget. It would stand on its own as a state budget item, which, you know, that might sound a little bit wonkish, but that's really, really important because when it stands alone as its separate item in the state budget, then we can actually, um, ensure that money goes to that program every year at a, a specific amount. And so, um, but in order to do that, we need to make sure that there's money in the budget and that the Met Council that operates Metro Mobility is adequately funded. So it's not simply good enough to say on a budget sheet, okay, Metro Mobility, we need to have a number by that budget. And right now it's almost $100 million unfunded that needs to be funded. Now they get a base amount, but you know, it's, it, it comes from sort of the, the broader Met Council budget now. It's not a separate item, it's not a separate forecasted item. And so um, uh, that is something I hope we can get done with the Senate, by the way. I mean, there's certain things, and I, I, don't, I didn't mean to sound so pessimistic or, or dour, um, there are certain things I think we can get done with the Senate. Uh, that's one of them. You know, when it comes to climate and transportation, I'm going to work as hard as I possibly can. I will fight as hard as I can with all of you, with the organizations I mentioned earlier. We're going to do our best, but um, I'm hoping, Ruth, that, that that's maybe one victory we can have this year along with Reconnect Rondo, right? Um, they may not go for uh, our $9 a year increase in the gas tax. They're opposed to $9 a year, believe it or not. Uh, you know, um, you would think that the, the sun wasn't gonna rise in the East because we were indexing the gas tax to inflation for safer roads and bridges, but you know, some things are more optimistic than others. Representative Hornstein, thank you so much. Uh, if we could all be here clapping, we would give you a standing ovation for your continued
commitment, work, uh, energy. Uh, we're, we are in solidarity with you and um, uh, stay on if you can. Uh, we appreciate I'll it. I'll definitely stay on for a little while. I've got uh, another meeting. I And, and I don't know if... Um, you know, uh, maybe th through you, Catherine, or, or others, I can, um, I just wanted to announce that we, uh, uh, I have, a, I'm involved in an Earth Day program myself on, on April 28th, and we're going to focus on climate and energy issues uh, in the area that I represent. Uh, but we want to, it's going to really be storytelling. Uh, we think it's so important for, it's not going to be the typical thing where, you um, some elected officials get up and tell you about their legislation. We have so many people, and I think there's so many people on this call that are doing incredible work. And we want to um, uh, uh, highlight our own neighbors and friends' work in this area. Great. And so young people, older people, it's April 28th at seven. I will send you information. Yes. Thank you, you for it. having me and thank you for your work. I mean, I have to tell you, and we're the first Unitarian Society of Minneapolis. Yes, yes. I thank the first Unitarian Society uh, and, and all of your hard work. You've been there every step of the way on social justice, environmental justice, racial justice, economic justice for so many years. I can't thank you enough. All right, I'm gonna move us along. Thank you again. Uh, now we're going to hear a short update from three speakers regarding Minnesota action in the legislature. First up is Emily Newhart from Minnesota 350, who will discuss the clean cars bill. Thank you, Emily. Awesome. Thank you. I'm just waiting for my slides to pop up here. Or maybe they are. My name is Emily. I'm a volunteer with MN350. I use she, her pronouns. Um, and thank you, Representative Hornstein. Um, I think one of the questions earlier before I launched into my slides was a timeline. Um, my understanding is that a decision on clean cars might be being made sometime in May here. Um, I could be wrong. Uh, and then the rule wouldn't go into effect until I think the year 2022. Um, so there is kind of a, a extended timeline, but that can, can definitely change. Um, so what is Clean Cars Minnesota? It's a initiative that is trying to um, set standards for the admissions um, that are released through new cars and light uh, duty trucks. So this won't impact the current truck cars that you're driving, ones that you can um, buy or sell used. And so this is trying to increase the supply and variety of electric vehicles in Minnesota. Uh, next slide. And so this rule is trying to be passed, but the, what is standing in the way? Um, there's quite a bit. Uh, on the right, you see some of the senators that have co-authored a bill that is passing through the Senate and it has a companion bill in the House. Um, Senator Matthews is the primary author on that. He's the one in the striped suit there, but it's Senate file 450 and House file 395. And it says that the MPCA, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, um, should adopt standards for air quality, but not relating to emissions from cars. Um, so this is really directly opposing the goal of Clean Cars Minnesota. And so um, the sole purpose or the purpose of the MPCA, among other things, is to help Minnesotans have healthy air. Um, and also it focuses on preventing and reducing the pollution of air. And so the state agency that is specialized to reduce our air pollution um, through this Senate file and House file would not be able to do its job and um, would not be able to set standards for our air pollution. Uh, so next slide. There, these are some of the representatives that co-authored the, um, the House file 395. Um, and there's also some other bills that are proving to be resistant to clean cars and its goals. There's this ominous um, environmental finance bill, which sort of combines multiple bills into one. And um, it's more likely that um, 
this omnibus bill would be like bills in an omnibus bill would pass instead of just on their own. So the Senate file 450 um, is wrapped up in that bill. And then also in the House, there's an amendment um, House or House 1684 Amendment 32 um, is an amendment to an omnibus bill um, in the House. And it directly says that the MPCA may not conduct rule light making to establish motor vehicle admission standards. Um, and so this again is trying to attack or get at um, getting in the way of Clean Cars Minnesota and taking away the ability of the MPCA to establish those clean air um, qualities that um, Representative Hornstein had mentioned earlier. Uh, next slide. And then, oh, hold on. I think something in the chat. Oh, sorry, correction. The amendment was not offered yesterday and is not in the transportation bill. So I think that's a, an update on my part. Um, so then what can you do to make a difference? Um, contact your legislators, including your Minnesota Senator, your Minnesota House Representative, and Governor Walls. Um, and this is important on some of those Senate files, House files, and then Governor Walls has the potential to veto bills as it comes before him. Next slide. So a really great website that I found is this one right here, where all you do on the left-hand side is enter your address, and then it'll create this list of all of your representatives. Um, that has proven to be really easy for me, and it provides phone numbers and emails. Um, so you can take a picture of this or you know, screenshot on your phone, um, and you can go to the next slide. But that's how I found it to be really easy to email and contact my legislators. Um, and then this slide is sort of a uh, nice little script where you can address your senator or representative by their last name, um, introduce yourself, show that you're a constituent, and really just start out saying that you want to contact them um, opposing any legislation that would remove the MPCA's ability to regulate emissions. Um, those are the Senate files again and the House one. Maybe we'll take off the, the amendment there and then Governor Walls, you can include the first three. Um, and what I like to do is just really personalize it, show like why I care, how this impacts me. Um, you know, just take it down to one story. Don't feel like you have to tell your whole life story. Um, for example, for me, my husband has a really strong history of um, cardiovascular problems in his family. And so having clean air, which relates to heart health, is really important to me as a Minnesotan and taking care of my family. So that's sort of what I weave into my letters to my representatives. Um, and then you just close out saying, you know, it's important for the MPCA to maintain their ability to have this rulemaking process. Um, and then you can just, you know, ask them to call you back or, or looking forward to their email back. And then you just sign your name. And sometimes I include my address too, which shows that your constituent. Uh, next slide. And so a great way of staying up to date on bills, including these and other ones that you might be interested in, is going to this website here. Um, you just create a login information and you can add your bill on the right hand side. Um, you can see it circled in green and you just add it and you can see the alerts and where it's um, going through the Senate and the House. Um, and just an important note is that this website does not give you email updates of the alerts. So what I try to do is maybe check it once a day if things are, um, if I'm watching a bill or sometimes multiple days if things are moving fast, um, but a couple times a week can be a great way to keep yourself updated. Um, and the last slide is just saying thank you and just reach out if you have any questions and thank you for your time. Thank you, Emily. Great, great presentation. Great summary. Um, I'd now like to welcome Marita Bujol, who's also from 350. She'll share information on the Headwaters Food and Water Bill. Hello. Uh, thank you for welcoming me to your gathering today. So I am the author of the bill, the Headwaters Community Food and Water Bill. And the purpose of this bill is to create and maintain a robust, locally adapted, regenerative food web economy designed from source to table to manage the demands of food, water, and climate. So it, this isn't just about farming, it's about every aspect of a food economy, all of the pieces that bring it to our table. And we are asked often, 
you know, why is it called the headwaters bill? Well, Minnesota is the headwaters for three major watersheds. And that positions us as leaders in caring for water. But as we know right now, we are all dependent on an industrial food chain that is unsustainable in every way. If you look at the condition of soil and water, wherever the industry operates, you'll find that it's contaminated by toxic chemicals or in the cases of the animal um, industry for producing meat, you have the toxic waste that's produced in quantities that cannot be addressed. So there's a real need for us to actually create a sustainable food economy. Right now, we're utterly dependent on a system that is publicly funded and is unsustainable. And it really is important to understand that this is a created economy. The Farm Bill combined with public investment and trade deals creates this industry. It does so in our name with those public investments. And whether you're shopping at a grocery store or a CS, using a CSA, even if you grow your own food, we're all paying for this system that's unsustainable. It also is a major contributor to climate change with greenhouse gases. So what we're doing with this bill is providing the infrastructure that's necessary to have a truly robust locally adapted system. And the reason we can do this is because we already know that the, the people who are actually feeding the world today are small scale farmers. It's little known fact that most of the food in the world grown today is grown by small scale farmers and they do it using only 20% of the world's water, fresh water each year compared to the industry which uses 80% of the world's fresh water to feed only 30% um, of the world's people. So what we know from, from this information is that the people who historically been the leaders in climate adaptation and capacity to grow food are the indigenous peoples who still in many cases around the world grow food as they did thousands of years ago using locally adapted plants and seeds, using practices that are sustainable and caring for their ecosystems. And as we all know, there really isn't anybody else who can do the job of caring for our ecosystems. We're the stewards, but we don't have an economy that's set up to actually support that role. So the purpose of this bill is to invest our dollars public dollars so that we can have a robust system that would allow us to actually be good stewards and do this continuing science and research on the ground in our communities and care for ecosystems while we're producing the food that we need and do it in a just way. The bill did not get a hearing this session. It does have 16 authors in the House and four in the Senate. We're very grateful for that. Minnesota 350 is promoting this bill as a just strategic climate solution. And we also have the recommendation from the House Select Committee on uh, Racial Justice. They're recommending this bill. So we have um, these re recommendations help us to understand how we can actually have a future that is environmentally and racially just. And um, we're very pleased with having this recommendation. I noticed earlier that um, in your opening remarks, Amy, you talked about how we don't, we don't want to look at climate as a personal issue. And I would agree. This isn't about us simply doing things differently ourselves. This is about making sure that we have in place the policies and the investments so that we can work together and create the conditions to be successful. And our economy is one of the key ways that we have to ha define how we're gonna move forward. And that's why this bill is created as it is to create an economic solution to a truly economic problem. 
releasing us from our dependence on a system that is unsustainable. So as much as we can do good work on our own, it's far more important that we come together to actually support true systemic change. And this bill is about making that happen. Now, the ways that you can help is that you can sign up to uh, pledge your support for the bill. Once you do, you can then, you will receive notices on future actions, including um, contacting your legislature and various other things. We are hosting events. We're having one next um, Sunday featuring myself, as well as uh, Representative Goli Her, who is the main author in the House. We hope that we will also be able to have future events where we'll feature other leaders who've signed on, including uh, Representative Frank Hornstein. He's one of the um, co-authors in the House. And we're specifically targeting right now the members of the Climate Caucus. So if your representative is a member of the Climate Caucus, please contact them and tell them we hope that they will co-author the bill. Um, I can take questions if you have them or uh, if we have time to take some. Thank you so much, Marita. Um, and good luck on all this work. It's so critical. Um, I'm going to say we're going to kind of move along because we're a little over time, but thank you. And, and your information will be um, on our list of resources. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to now uh, welcome Amanda Kohler from the Land Stewardship Project, who will talk about the 100% Soil Health Farming Bill. Amanda? Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Um, unfortunately, the Wi-Fi is out on my block, so you are only going to see um, my, well, you won't see me, and I, I apologize for that. Um, my name is Amanda Kohler. I use she, her pronouns. I'm with the Land Stewardship Project, which is an organization working to um, transform our farm and food system and have healthy communities. Um, two thirds of our members are rural, a quarter are farmers, and the rest are urban and suburban um, allies of these folks. And about um, nine months ago, maybe six to nine months ago, our members came together and said, um, you know, the farm and food system we have right now is not working. Um, agriculture has the potential to, um, to really not just decrease the amount of carbon that we're putting into the atmosphere, but also sequester carbon, put it back in the ground, put it back in vegetation um, where it came from to begin with. And so over 2,000 of our members and supporters came together and crafted the 100% soil healthy farming bill in Minnesota. Um, I'll be able to share some links with you all through um, Catherine and, and other folks here. Um, I um, wanted to share with you all the, the link to our petition and describe the bill and tell you a little bit about where we're at. Um, and tell you about a couple of opportunities that's coming up. Again, it's the 100% soil healthy farming bill, um, House File 701 and Senate File 1113. We introduced the bill in um, February. It passed 11 to one out of the House Ag Committee, um, passed out of the Civil Law Committee and Key portions of the bill have been included in a few of the House omnibus bills in Minnesota. What the whole bill does in its form is it's, it sets goals for soil healthy farming in Minnesota. The goal of 50% of farmers trying out soil healthy practices by 2030, 100% of farmers by 2035, and 100% uh, of acres by 2040. Uh, the reason we started with acres and then farmers was uh, because, I'm sorry, farmers and then acres is because so many farmers try out these practices on you know, a few acres and grow and grow and grow from there because it is an experiment, it is new, it is an emerging um, thing that's happening on the landscape. Um, and so 
beyond setting those goals, it also provides the upfront money and up to five years of sustaining direct payments to really help establish and sustain these practices. So it can be really, really expensive to start a practice, whether that is um, cover crops, organic, perennial cropping, managed rotational grazing. Um, there's a whole slew of them because there's the cost of seed. There's the cost of like technical assistance and education. It can be hundreds of thousands of dollars to get uh, a new piece of farm equipment. Um, there's so many things that go into it. And most of our farmers right now, small and mid-sized farmers, are finally starting to rebound. But there was about seven years of very low prices. And Minnesota lost a lot of our small and mid-sized farmers because of the economic crisis. So we want to make sure that all farmers have all of the um, resources that they need to scale up these practices on the land. It also um, has priority in there so that farmers who need the money most are prioritized. So this includes black, brown, indigenous farmers, women farmers, farmers with disabilities, and small and mid-sized farmers um, in, uh, in various orders. And it collects data through the Board of Water and Soil Resources, as well as the, soil, the Minnesota Office of Soil Health. So we greater understand how specific practices in various soil profiles across the state um, build the health of our soil. Um, so what's moving forward right now is there's um, over $7 million in the House Clean Water Fund Bill for soil healthy practices. Um, some of this language is, is LSPs, some is from um, the chair and then it, the House Environment Bill that Representative Hornstein mentioned is up um, later next week, includes 30% um, soil healthy farming by 2030. So that's not as aggressive as our goal originally is, but it is a really big step forward and we wanna get this into law so we can continue to build on it. In addition, the, that same bill, the House Environment Bill, um, does create for the first time in Minnesota a soil health cost share program um, and appropriates a million dollars to it. So overall, we, we have about eight to nine million dollars that the House is proposing, as well as this great policy as a, as a strong step forward. Um, however, the, the Senate has not taken any action on these bills. And what we need is to make sure they hear us loud and clear during conference committee when the House and Senate come together and um, decide, you know, compromise on what their final versions of the bill are. So they need to hear us loud and clear that we really need these investments um, in, our, in our farming system. So I will share with you all, we have a petition for the bill. Uh, we have over 2,500 signatures from Minnesotans across the state. And we are delivering that petition to the commissioner of the Department of Agriculture um, and the executive director of the Board of Water and Soil Resources in just about a week, um, or just a couple of weeks here, about two weeks from now. And we're really excited about that. Um, they're meeting with us for about 45 minutes and we'll share our stories and um, hand over the petition virtually. So anyone is welcome to join us for that conversation. Um, we are also celebrating some of the legislators who've been champions on this. So that's Representative Todd Lippert from Northfield, um, Senator Kent Eakin from up in um, the Moorhead area and others um, in an event. So I'll include that. And finally, on Earth Day, Land Stewardship Project, in coalition with many of the groups that have um, been mentioned already today, is hosting a grassroots lobbying 101 event um, from 10.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Um, and I'll be talking about how to um, lobby your legislators. So be, um, yeah, join us for that if you can. And I'll, I'll make sure the folks here have all those links. Thanks Great. again for having me. Amanda, thank you so much. And thanks for all the work that you're doing. Uh, we are Nearing the end, we have a quick update from Marcy Lesser, who is also a member of the First Unitarian Society, and will give us an update on line three. Marcy. 
Hi, I'm Marcy Lessler, a member of First Unitarian Society, and this is about Line 3. As you might know, Line 3 is a pipeline that is currently being built in northern Minnesota. It is not a replacement pipeline of the existing pipeline, but an expansion that it is making a new route through forest and wetlands and will cross over 200 bodies of water. Line 3 will carry tar sands oil, the dirtiest kind, from Alberta, Canada, and it is diluted with harsh chemicals to get it to flow through the pipe. The emissions from this pipeline are the equivalent of 50 coal plants. Building this pipeline will, in effect, undo any other efforts to reduce emissions and mitigate climate change. This pipeline should not be built. For the climate, this will be the equivalent of 50 coal plants. For the treaties, this is an environmental justice issue because it is going through treaty territories and infringes on the rights of indigenous people to hunt, fish, and gather food and medicines. For the water, just the construction alone of this pipeline is damaging to the wetlands. All pipelines leak at some time and the potential for a spill is too great to risk it. President Biden has canceled the permits for Keystone XL, yay, and he could do the same for line three, but he's given no indication yet that he's going to do that. Some of our representatives, including Representative Ilhan Omar and Representative Betty McCollum, have sent a letter to him asking him to cancel the permit until a complete environmental impact statement is completed. And many of us have called and signed petitions, but nothing has happened yet. We are waiting. Um, also, there is an appeal in, in the court that could stop construction, but the ruling is not expected until late June. In the meantime, construction continues on line three. We are resisting the pipeline and we are supporting the camps that are res resisting the pipeline. This is an environmental justice issue. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Marcy. And I'm gonna turn it over to Kelly for our closing. Friends, friends, the local and global challenges to climate justice are overwhelming when we face them alone. And the beauty of working in our congregation and in our community with organizations like we've heard from today and representatives like we've heard from today is that we do not face them alone. We gain strength and hope from each other. I want to give thanks to our co-chairs of the First Unitarian Society Climate Justice Team, Amy Dreyer and Catherine Jordan. Thank you for your leadership. To all our Earth Day planning team, hearty appreciation to Delaney Anderson and Justice Bovey for your mighty technical assistance. And a special thanks to all our speakers for being present with us and for your work in the world. You've given us a lot to think about and to do. And thanks to everyone here who joined us today for spending your time with us to learn, to act, and to share. This program will be posted on the First Unitarian Society of Minneapolis YouTube channel. We invite you to return back to it and share it with your friends. Here's a reminder about our film screening on Earth Day, Thursday, April 22nd at 6 p.m. to watch The Story of Plastic. You can find the link at mnearthday.com. With words adapted from Maureen Killerin, we extinguish our chalice flame, daring to carry forward the vision that freedom, reason, and justice will one day prevail in this state, nation, and across the earth. Blessed be and go in peace.